Ladies and gentlemen, we are live from the compound with Professor Scott Galloway. Professor Galloway is a professor of marketing at the NYU Stern School of Business, best-selling author, founder, podcast host, raconteur. Scott, is that too much? I keep or is going. it just right? I'm enjoying this. Keep going. You like it. Okay. Yeah, uh, Scott was ranked one of the 50 best business school professors. He's founded multiple companies, including L2, Red Envelope, Profit, and has served on the boards of Eddie Bauer, The New York Times, and others. Uh, Scott, welcome to Live from the Compound. We're so happy to have you with us today. Uh, Josh, Michael, it's good to be with you. This is, this is great. I wanted to say congratulations on the new book. And I know you get a little bit nervous on the cusp of releasing a book because you told me a few minutes ago. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But the book is called The Algebra of Wealth. And it sounds like it's right in Michael and I, right, right in our wheelhouse. Uh, when does the book come out and who is it for? Uh, it comes out next week and it's for our younger selves. It's for, uh, let me be clear, who it's not for. It's not for someone who's struggling with their finances and it's not a Susie Orman, you know, or I forget the guy, guy's name, Pacman, uh, cut up your credit cards, just pay with cash. This is for someone who has their act together, feels like they are or they're going to make a good living. And it's sort of based off the research that shows that, have you seen that research, Josh, that you are kind of the average of your five closest friends? You become the same body mass, yes. the same political affi affiliation, the same economics, I mean, everything, the same sports. But what's where there's greater variance is even if you make the same amount of money, someone will end up very wealthy and someone will end up very not wealthy. And I tried to look at what are the behaviors and the strategies of people who don't make an extraordinary amount of money but end up financially secure. Because there okay. is there are strategies and activities. So who it's really for, it's for young people who feel like they're making decent money, maybe in some day they'll make great money, but they want to be, they want to know that they're going to be uh, economically secure. So when you've been very successful in media, in marketing, in technology investing, content creation, academia, what made you want to write a book about wealth? Is there something specific about the timing of the book? Is there something going on in your life that made you spend a lot of time thinking about the concept of what are, you know, what are, what are the things that wealthy people uh, have in common or the people who end up financially secure? Like what, what brought this on? Well, what brought it on is I think a lot about young men and you know, I wish I had known, I've always made a lot of money, but I ended up because of bad to some bad decisions broke at 42 or nearly broke. And uh, if I had just implemented a few basic kind of character building strategies, I wouldn't have had that kind of anxiety. Now I recovered well, but it's really sort of advice to my 25 year old self. And I believe that America becomes more like itself every day. I think America is a loving, generous pa place for people with money. I think it's a rapacious, violent place for people without money. And while we all like to think that money and happiness aren't correlated, there's a ton of research showing they are, it is. And I think a young person has an imperative to be really thoughtful about financial literacy and developing a series of skills and character traits that will ensure that if they don't have a bestseller or a hit album or sell their company for a ton of money or happen to invest in NVIDIA when it's at a buck, that they're still gonna have some reasonable semblance of financial security. So this is sort of advice to my 25 year old self. Scott, to that end, I'm curious how your thoughts on money have changed over time. I know that I've read The Algebra of Wealth, I'm sorry, of Happiness, which I loved. Thank you. You come from humble beginnings, but I think one of the reasons why you've caught on with America is because you're very open and transparent about who you are, where you've come from. And right now you're a wealthy man and you weren't mm -hmm. always. Mm -hmm. So do you still do you still view yourself as the person with nothing? Or do you think like, holy shit, I'm, I'm rich and this is pretty cool? I mean, the answer is yes. I still have tremendous financial anxiety. I, I went out to dinner with Josh and Barry and I, I feel a need to like tell them what I have and get their advice. I'm worried every day that I'm gonna go back to the, when I was 42, I had made a shit ton of money up to that point. I had taken a company public, but because of divorce, because of not being diversified at all, because of, you know, not out of control consumption, but decent consumption, and a belief that I was always gonna have like the big, big win. When my first son was born, uh, you know, you're supposed to see bright lights and hear angels singing. 
I was so sick and nauseous, and they thought it was because of the experience of childbirth, and that's part of it. But (laughs) what really made me nauseous was I felt nothing but terror because all of a sudden I was responsible for someone else, and I was failing as a father the moment this thing came into the world because I hadn't made just some simple decisions and strategies to put myself on firmer financial footing. And I was not only failing myself, I was now failing a son. And it was just so humiliating and upsetting. And I thought, okay, I got to get really serious about financial security. And what I tell people, a lot of people say, well, I'm in my 40s. It's too late for me. I'm like, no, it's not. You're going to live to be 90. You're going to live another 50 years. You might have to spend more time catching up. You might have to implement these strategies more severely. But for me, it's, for me, it's look, I, I, I'm constantly insecure about money. What I've done with my money now is I've realized, and this is hard to do, once you have a level of economic security, what you realize is money is the ink in your pen. It can write new chapters. It can make certain chapters burn brighter, but it's not your story. And so for me, money is a means. And the ends is it takes away a lot of anxiety for me so I can spend a lot of time with my loved ones and do amazing things with people I care about and cement and deepen those relationships. And it also gives me the chance to give away money and get involved in things I'm passionate about, which, which for me is consumption because it makes me feel masculine. It makes me feel like a baller. So it's not even philanthropy. So I, I'm an atheist. I think at some point I'm going to look into my kid's eyes and know our relationship is coming to an end. I hit my quote unquote number five years ago and I decided above that number, I was not going to hoard wealth. I was either going to spend it or give it away. So I'm just squeezing the shit out of this lemon called life. I'm doing amazing things. I'm giving a shit ton of money away and I'm having a great time. I'm trying to pivot into the notion that money is is the means. It's not the ends. And for most of my life, it was both the means and the ends. So I'm trying to get off that hamster wheel. So Scott, one of the things that you said just now really resonated with me because I had a similar experience. I think your moment uh, that you described was probably related to the dot com crash in that era, mm-hmm. and mine was mine was during the financial crisis. I have I was having my second child in March uh, in uh, the summer of two thousand nine, and that was when I was at my personal rock bottom. I had been through two thousand eight. I already had one child. I already had a mortgage I couldn't pay and a house I couldn't afford. So I was that's where I was. But I feel like that was a catalyst that moment, like, all right, get serious. Mm-hmm. And within a year of, of going, I fell asleep in the delivery room on the floor. That's how stressed out I was when my second, when my son was born, the nurses told my wife, they had never seen anything like it. Um, so I think I had like a, a month of sleepless nights going into the, the actual delivery. Um, mm-hmm. but I need in hindsight, I needed that. Do you feel the same way? Like you needed to get that kick in the ass and not everybody goes on to achieve great things without having to battle back from somewhere dark? Because that's the way I feel. Yeah, I needed it. And it, sound, it sounds like, by the way, both it happened to me twice. I was supposedly worth 40 or $60 million on paper in 99. My stake in Red Envelope, we were going public. Frank Quattrone from Credit Suisse First Boston was taking this public. I was looking at jets. By 2000, by March of 2000, I, was, I had negative net worth. 2007, clawed my way back, worked my ass off. Financial security, I thought on paper, boom, I'm broke again. So, and that was the first, really one of the first big lessons was just the power, all caps, diversification. The moment you have assets, start diversifying. Because Josh, what I've come to recognize is I know the brightest minds in the world in finance, and with respect to which one investment will go up, nobody knows. And- the easiest way to get risk-free return is to diversify. And if I just done a little bit of diversification at a younger age, I would have been, I would have been in a in a in just a a, a much much better position. I wanted to ask you. There have been several books written about wealth, coming from the perspective of very wealthy people, hedge oh, fund yeah. managers, private equity CEOs, celebrities. Mm -hmm. They don't always hit the mark for ordinary readers for obvious reasons. It sounds like you're aiming for the middle to upper class person, Mm -hmm. um, which I think is smart because, you know, there's, there's a different type of help needed at, at a, at a, at a lower income level, of course. Um, but how will your book be different from some of the ones written from the perspective of other wealthy investors, um, 
you know, how, how are you thinking about the person who's going to be reading it? Well, I try to distill it down, just as I did with the algebra of happiness. I, d- I try to distill it down to an equation that people can hold on to and start applying fairly easily in their life. And I'll give you the equation, and I would love your and Michael's pushback feedback. So the first is focus. And your 20s is for figuring out what your talent is. And uh, the worst advice I think kids get is every graduation speech telling them to follow their passion. If someone tells you to follow your passion, it means they're already rich. And typically, the person telling you to follow your passion made their billions in iron ore smelting. Your job is to find your talent and ideally find your talent and commit to something that has a 90 plus percent employment rate. What do I mean by that? Well, I want to be a DJ and I'm really good at it. Well, okay, unless you're in the top 0.1% of being a DJ, a restaurateur, a nightclub owner, uh, an artist, an actor, 180,000 people in sag after These are the best actors and people in film production in the world. 87% of them make less than $23,000 a year and don't qualify for health insurance. And what I suggest is that if you can find something that you're good at and could be great at it and commit to becoming great at it, that if it's in a 90 plus percent employment sector, which is 95% of the industry, being great at something and the economic accoutrements, the relevance, will make you passionate about whatever it is. So as you get older, and Josh and I, Michael, I don't know your situation, but I'm super f-ing passionate about taking care of my kids. I am massively, I get huge joy from being able to economically take care of my 93-year-old father. I, I, I love, I am passionate about not having the economic stress that I had for the first five decades of my life. That makes me passionate about what I do. And so what I tell kids in their 20s, it's about focus and finding your talent in an industry that has a strong employment base where you just need to be in the top half, much less the top 10% to make a good living. The next thing is stoicism. It's kind of an incorrect word, but recognize that as Morgan Housel says, no one is, is thinking about your stuff as much as you are. And to try and recognize that character and 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 friendships you know come from discipline and develop a savings muscle i'm not suggesting that you be totally frugal in your 20s youth is fleeting go to coachella pick up a backpack and travel but try to at least develop a savings muscle where 100 bucks a month 200 bucks a month you just get used to the notion that you make as much as you spend and maybe a little bit more and just put away a little bit of money and obviously there's the lessons about compound interest but even more powerful than that you want to develop a savings muscle such that when you get to your 30s and after you found your focus and your talent and you start making real money, that muscle memory is right there. I know how to save money. I've done this before. And people underestimate how hard it is because keep in mind, there's a conspiracy being prosecuted by the most talented, well-resourced companies in the world to convince you at the exact moment you're vulnerable that an upgrade from economy to economy comfort is a good idea that adding on that flourless chocolate cake from Baltazar to your order from, you know, from, from uh, Chipotle or from whatever it is, the juice guys, is a smart move. To adding on, uh, getting a second pair of on running shoes for 20%. Everywhere conspires to soak you of every piece of disposable income and more. So having the ability to separate your emotions and your need for gratification uh, such that you can make more than you spend takes real stoicism and real discipline. The third thing is diversification. We talked about that. And then finally, recognizing the flaw in our species because for 98% of our time on this planet, we haven't lived past 35, to just recognize how fast time will go. And just a little bit of discipline, a little bit of saving, a little bit of diversification. I mean, Josh and Michael, I don't know about you, I was 24 yesterday. And when my buddy, who I used to go to the beach with, was saying, I got to find money to max out my IRA Roth, it was 2,000 bucks, and he was stressed. And I'm like, I remember saying to him these exact words, if 2,000 bucks means anything to me when I'm older, shoot me. But here's the thing, 35 years on, that 2,000 bucks and that 2,000 bucks he kept putting away is literally several million dollars now. And I was too arrogant and stupid to recognize that I'm going to live another 50, 70, 80 years, and it's going to go by so fast. How do you so just t- recognize so, the power of time. So I, lo- I actually love all of those things, but I want to peel back the layers on one of them. Mm-hmm. When somebody in their 20s, you say to them, look, it's going to go by fast, go to Coachella, do these things. I totally agree. 
And I find myself, I mean, I don't know why people ask me for advice given what a, a disaster my 20s were. Um, maybe, you know, but whatever. I, I tried it. So they, like, they say like, well, how do I know when to live a little and mm-hmm. when not to? So the example that I try to give people, I'm curious what you think or what Michael thinks, is like focus on the stuff that you will only enjoy doing in your 20s and 30s. So leasing a BMW is stupid because you could always do that. You'll enjoy doing that in your 50s. You will not enjoy going to Coachella in your 50s unless you're friends with the band, right? So like the experiences that will be the best, like bachelor parties or think like things that you do with your friends before everyone's married, that's the stuff worth spending on. The things that you could always do later, that's the stuff that maybe you don't spend on. What do you think of that? Um, what do you think about that framing? I think that's exactly right, and there's research. The research shows that we overestimate the happiness that things will give us, and we underestimate the happiness that experiences will give us. Yeah. So by all means, you know, save the money so you can go to whatever, Austin for a bachelor party. Save the money so you can take a backpack and go with friends or a girlfriend to see, you know, to go to the Fringe Festival in Edinburgh, whatever it is. Also, just try and spend as much um, much of your finite money on experiences with other people. Um, it, it, the, the key, one of the keys to success is that greatness is in the agency of others. One of the Google hiring managers said when we put out a product at manager description, we get 200 resumes, we limit it down to 20. And about 80 or 90% of the time, the one person who gets the job was referred internally and has an advocate internally. Your job in your 20s is to collect a set of allies and experiences that strengthen those alliances such that you're constantly put in a room of opportunities even when you're not in that room. And also, quite frankly, to find a really fantastic partner, a mate, because you don't find a mate on Tinder, in my opinion, you don't find a mate on Zoom. You need to get out and you need to make mentors, friends, and find romantic partners in your 20s. So spend your money. I think just have a small, clean place near work so you can focus on being at work. I think remote work is a disaster for young people. Uh, try and try and really lean into the fact that, especially for men, that you have superior bone and muscle structure and this amazing thing called testosterone, and get really f-ing strong. I think anyone under the age of thirty should be able to walk into any room and realize if shit got real, they could kill and eat everybody or outrun them. I would say really lean into your physical fitness when you're young, really lean into experiences, and really lean into environments where you're meeting and cementing relationships that'll carry you a lifetime. Don't buy things. You don't need things. Occasionally, a little bit of peacocking. I get it. You're in your mating years. Spend money on experiences and solidifying and introducing yourself to new relationships. Scott, you mentioned that you hit your number five years ago. I'm curious, that number of yours, Mm -hmm. how many times- Michael wants to know the number. (laughs) What's what's your number? Now, how how many times did did you adjust that? And before I give the mic back to you, I think that the hedonic treadmill doesn't have to be a bad thing. Now, it can be. Mm -hmm. If you're obsessed with money and it's your only metric for defining who you are and it's never enough, that's, that's horrendous. That's not a good thing. But if you want more for the sake of not just dollars, but progress and growth, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that benefits society. So how do you think about your number? Where did that come from? And just curious to hear your, your thoughts on that. So in reverse order, I wanted a number where with three to 4% post-tax on my asset base, I could do absolutely everything I wanted and never worry about money and even have money to give away. And by the way, my number changed. When I was in my 20s or 30s, if someone had said, you're going to be worth 10 million bucks, I would have like hit that bid right away. Yeah. My number as I got older and my tastes <laughs> changed and kids and I started moving to high cost areas, my number substantially changed. Um, substantially um, increase. Now, in terms of the hedonic treadmill, what you're talking about, and I try to be as transparent. I don't, I'm not, I didn't write a book about what should be. I wrote a book about what I think is. And it's not a Hallmark Channel book. When I was from the age of 25 to 45, 47, I did nothing but work. I did nothing but work. I was totally obsessed is probably the right word with establishing economic security. I grew up without a lot of money. I wasn't able to take care of my mom in the, in the manner that I'd hoped to, which I found humiliating and emasculating. I noticed that fairly uninteresting guys 
were getting really interesting high character women if they had a lot of money and interesting high character guys were not getting great partners if they didn't have money. It just for me in America, I figured out very early the road to the things I want involved money in a lot of it. I did nothing but work for the better part of two and a half decades. It cost me my hair. It was emotionally and mentally very taxing. It cost me my marriage, Michael, and it was worth it. Uh, my life now is full of balance, full of relationships, full of full of citizenship because of that sacrifice. And what I tell young people is you can have it all, you just can't have it all at once. And if you wanna move to a lower cost neighborhood and coach Little League and live to work as opposed to work to live, and you don't need that kind of capital, more power to you, my brothers and sisters. But where I see a disconnect is when I see young people talking about, I say, what kind of life do you expect to lead? What does that mean economically? Where do you expect to lead? What kind of life do you expect to lead? Okay, realistically, how much money is that? And then they use the word balance in their priorities. I'm like, okay, yeah. boss, if you want balance, move to a suburb of St. Louis, and you and your wife, if you work, if you, you know, she's a, you're a nurse, she's a chiropractor, you make 120 grand a year, 150 grand, you're gonna have a nice life. You wanna live in New York and have a nice place and have two kids, you need to make a million bucks a year, minimum. And yeah. to make a million bucks a year in this economy, it need, means you need to be outstanding and work your ass off. So what the book is about and what I try to have this conversation is you just have a, have a sober conversation. The majority of young people I know expect a lifestyle that involves a massive trade-off in terms of time and energy and sacrifice. They don't all know it. They know what they want. They don't all fully understand what it's going to take to get there. And there's an even scarier part of this, which I'm sure you go into in the book. Um, but the even scarier part is you might do all the right things and not end up in that situation where you can earn something insane like seven figures a year. So then you, so then there, there's a whole other branch of the tree where you go off in this direction of, I sacrificed everything and I'm still not happy. But you talked about something. You said, you know, that moment when 2008, when you got beamed in the face, I've been beamed in the face, I call it shot in the face twice. The yeah. key to success is your ability to mourn and move on. And I know a okay. lot of people, they know, mostly success their whole life. They have a financial disaster, a divorce, a business failure, and they never recover. They're stuck. That's right. They lose their mojo. They get paralyzed. Nothing's ever good enough to get another job, or they want to raise money for their new fund, but they can't quite set up the meetings, or they keep waiting to interview, or they don't want to make the cold cars. They don't want to, the cold calls. They don't want to do the hard work. They don't want to go out and start dating again, and they just go into stasis. So part of success is the ability, again, to get punched in the gut, get off the floor, and you know, take the eight count, take some time, and then go out, you know, go out, go out swinging again. But it's been, I mean, uh, it, it, the thing that's really rewarding is, you know, is is building something with somebody and, and then enjoying the money for, you know, relationships. Scott, I'd be curious to hear your take on the following. I grew up um, with. I was fine. I was, I had everything I need, but we were not like Aruba people. I was like a, a train ride to DC or a car ride to Boston more accurately. And then when I graduated college, I, I was terrible. And so the economic security that I have now, I like, I can't believe it because I never thought mm -hmm. I would be making any money. And so I think that there's a common thread where that people that don't start off life with money and weren't given anything appreciate it so much more later in life. Not a controversial take. So I'd be curious with that said, how do you balance giving your kids everything that you probably didn't have growing up and but not giving them too much to spoil them? Uh, Michael, the, the honest answer is I have no idea. And yeah, we'll, we'll find out in 10 years. <laughs> it's, it's something I think about every day. It's something that other parents who are blessed like me talk about all the time, because here's the thing. If I had what my kids have, I wouldn't have what I have. Exactly. If if I had what my kids have, the only two things I'd know in my I'd have in my life are a Range Rover and a cocaine habit. I was lazy <laughs> and my motivate I didn't want to change the world. I didn't feel a need to be relevant. I didn't feel a need to have a purpose. I'm not naturally a hard worker. I did it because I was raised by a single mother and there were real moments of stress that I never wanted to experience again. And my kids don't have that stress. So 
I, you know, I do the basics. I have them play competitive sports. I have them do chores. I try to link the value of money. You know, on the airlines where they'll let you, I stick them in coach. I mean, I just, but I, I don't know. I'm all ears on how to instill a sense of grit and appreciation and drive in that fire. Because the reality is, the reason I have it is because I didn't I didn't have a lot. So it's something Scott, I think I, about Scott, a lot. I think, there's, I think there's two reasons you have it. The first, which you just explained, is absolutely true. But the second reason, and maybe beyond the scope of what we're talking about today, but worth bringing up is you did figure out something that you can do better than 99% of people in the world. Like you found this thing that's a perfect fit for the lifestyle you want to live, the talents that you were born with, and the things that you want to work on and get better at. You're a brilliant writer and speaker and thinker and communicator. That so to, from my perspective, the things the the thing that we all want to focus on with our children, whether we're giving them a lot or not, is helping them to that moment where they realize, oh shit, I'm really good at this. I can not only make a living but enjoy it. Like so, I think that that is often the answer, you know, for for the conundrum of what if I'm giving my kids too much. Yeah, so you bring up a couple of things there. First off, thank you for the, for the generous words. But I was asked on the last podcast I was, I was on, what would you, what skill would you give your kids? Would it be programming or Mandarin or critical thinking? Hands down, the skill I would want my kids to inherit that has provided an extraordinary living for me is storytelling. The ability to take external data and then communicate it, whether it's the written word or PowerPoint or on a podcast or through humor. It's going to yeah. help you professionally and personally. If there was something I could, and I her inherited it from my father. The other thing you have to realize is that a lot of your success and a lot of your failure is not your fault. If I'd been born a man in 1920s Germany, I would have been dead on some Russian field somewhere. Being born in the 60s, a white heterosexual male in California gave me unfair advantage. I got free ed accessible education, UCLA 76% admissions rate when I applied, it's 9% now. Berkeley, I got a 2.27 GPA at UCLA undergrad, and then Berkeley let me into graduate school. Figure that one out. I got into graduate school at Berkeley with a 2.27 GPA, and my total tuition all seven years, undergrad and grad, was $7,000. None of those things would happen right now. Here's, and this is why I'm very, you know, th this is why I'm kind of trying to lean into to struggling young men. Yeah. The reason I'm here is not my fault. It's because of the generosity and vision of California taxpayers and the Regents of the University of California and an America that loved unremarkable kids. We've positioned differently. Now uh, universities in the corporate world are trying to identify the top 1% and supercharge them to become billionaires. I think yeah, we're I was gonna say at, six, at 16. Yeah, and here's right. the thing, no organization or person can predict greatness at 18. Did you have your yeah. shit together, Josh? Did Michael, did you? <laughs> we're the I opposite. Mean, <laughs> I, I, I graduated nobody from UCLA. Was nobody was recruiting us to do anything. Yeah, Scott, I got kicked out of the same college twice. <laughs> twice? Twice. I almost got, I was on academic probation three times, subject to dismissal twice. When I graduated from UCLA, the only thing I knew how to do was make bongs out of common household items, and I knew every line from the Planet of the Apes. Right. I lied about my grades. I'm a good talker. I got into Morgan Stanley, got into business school. My mom got sick. That was a huge kick in the ass for me. And from the age of 27 on, I got my act together. But I didn't get my act together until I was 27. And so yeah. if higher ed wanted to decide who are going to be the winners and the losers and not let them in, I would have been one of the losers. And in my opinion, higher education in America isn't about identifying the top 10%. It's about giving the bottom 90 a chance to creep into the top 10%. And what I worry about with young people, especially young men who have fallen further faster in our nation than any other group, Four times as likely to kill themselves, three times as likely to be addicted, 12 times as likely to be incarcerated, more single women own homes than single men. And let me be clear, the ascent of women is wonderful and we should do nothing to get in the way of that. But the notion that somehow young men had anything resembling the advantage I enjoyed ignores all data, ignores all data. So I'm really uh, trying to lean into trying to figure out vocational programs, funding, and different types of media and different types of social programs that help young men get a semblance of the advantages that I definitely had and to a lesser extent, Josh and Michael had. 
So on this topic, you said you said years ago that it's never been easier to become a billionaire, never been harder to become a millionaire. Do you still feel that way? And if so, what are the ramifications for that on society? When I got out of business school, we all kind of made between ninety and one hundred twenty thousand dollars. If you got a job with a consulting firm or a finance firm, you made one hundred twenty or one hundred thirty. If you got a job in brand management, you made ninety. In my class of three hundred kids, every year. And I need to do the research here, but I'm pretty confident in every year with 300 kids, I have one kid who will be a billionaire, either through alternative investments or technology. And I think I'll have probably a dozen that end up living with their parents. And that is our economy has increasingly become kind of the hunger games because of technology, because of income inequality, because seven stocks, and I'm getting into your area now, are 60% of the S&P's return. Look, if you ended up as a product manager at NVIDIA five years ago, you probably have 30 to $50 million in equity right now through no fault yeah. of your own. And if you went to work at, Christ, I don't know, General Motors or any number of small tech startups that didn't make it, you got your 110 or your 120 grand salary, but you weren't able to save any money. You probably needed your parents, actually, if you had to live I'm in I'm so York. glad you said that. And you know what's the craziest part of that is that your parents probably would have pushed you toward General Motors because That's what right. the f*** is NVIDIA? That's right. No one knows. No one yeah. knows. So, and these are the ramifications. When you have the kind of income inequality we have in this nation, the bad news is it keeps getting worse. The good news is it's always self-correcting. The more bad news is the means of self-correction are war, famine, and revolution. And I believe that the dissatisfaction we have in this nation, where we every kind of opportunistic infection blows up into a full disease, Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement, these are righteous movements where people are justifiably angry, but they turn into very strong anti-American tropes, despite the fact that for all its flaws, America has made remarkable progress around women. America has made remarkable progress around non-whites. There were 12 black people total at Princeton, Yale, and Harvard in 1960. This year, 51% of the freshman class at Harvard is non-white. That is a huge victory. A huge victory. When I was at UCLA, you weren't allowed to be gay. No one could be out. Now it's, I mean, I don't want to say it's been normalized, but they enjoy, I think, many of the same rights and freedoms I do. There is, America has come, we have enormous reason to celebrate, and yet we're raising a generation of young people that hate America. So I find, I, I find our inability to communicate the wonderful things about America is in large part a function of one, income inequality. You see people under the age of 40 have had their percentage, their net worth as a percentage of GDP cut in half from 13% to 7%. They're making less money than we did at their age. And the, the breakdown in the social compact is the following. For the first time in our nation's history, a 30-year-old man or woman isn't making as much money as his or her parents were at 30. That not only brings shame to the kids, it puts a strain on the relationship with the parents. It yeah. makes young men less attractive to women. There's less household formation because three quarters of women say economic viability is a key criteria in a mate. It's only 25% for women. Women made socioeconomically horizontally and up, men horizontally and down. And when the pool of horizontal and up is shrinking because young men are failing, you just have a lack of household formation and you have exceptional increases in loneliness between the ages of 30 and 34. In 1990, 67% of people had at least one child. Now it's 27%. People aren't having kids because they can't afford them. So I don't think this ends well. I think unless we start giving young people more opportunity and letting them share in the immense, unprecedented prosperity of our nation, we're going to end up with an angry populace that takes every injustice and blows it up into a fatal explosion where they hate America and you have a group of, we have the most angry and depressed generation ever in America. And, uh, and what's worse about it is these were all concerted decisions through economic and tax policies. So I, I think that there's an enormous recalibration of our priorities that needs to take place. I think that's a really great message. I wanna leave the viewers and listeners uh, with just something about your writing process. Of course, a lot of the people who watch The Compound are entrepreneurs or would love to take some of their ideas and do something creative and possibly commercial with them. You've now written, how, how many books is it? I think this is my fifth book. The fifth, fifth. okay. Yeah. Are you getting better at the process of coming up with an idea and then actually writing it, turning it into a book? Or do you feel like you're starting from scratch each time? Because 
I picture you having a new idea like every day or every week. That could go all the way and become a book, but of course you can't do that because there's not enough time in 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 the day. So how do you know when it's time to push the button and actually write one? And are you getting better at it? So I write a newsletter every week, No Mercy No Malice. It's about 2,000 words. And so that's a ten, that's basically a chance to beta test the product. So yeah. when I write about young men and it resonates, when I write about the ills of big tech and it resonates, I'm like, okay, this could be a this could be a book. And usually my publisher will call me and say, we could turn this into a book. Well, they'll, and, they'll call you and tell you that every week. <laughs> Pretty much. I just, I'm actually in the midst of doing a three book deal. And then I do a video and if the video goes viral, you get a sense for what the market wants. The advice I would have is I wrote my first book at um, 47, 48. It's never too late to start writing. To just start and don't wait for an agent. Don't think about the theme. Just start writing a chapter, come up with a table of contents and start writing. And the only way you get better at writing is writing and reading. And the thing I try and do is I try to write as if no one's going to read it. I try to be fearless. I try to think about not being politically correct. I, I use foul language because it's authentic. It's me. I make references to violence and sex because that is actually the way I think. But what, what people want to read is they want to read something that feels authentic and like there's voice in it. So try, I don't ignore what my publishers say because they're smart people and they get the environment. But what people want is something that feels real. And the key to writing is flipping open your notebook, your, your laptop, and just starting. In terms of tricks of trade, you know, most writers will say they write in the morning. I write alone at night with my dogs at like from 11 p.m. to 1 a.m., sometimes with a drink in my hand. So it's really every, the creative process is different for everybody. But look, just start. You're no better or no worse than anyone in their first novel. And write as if no one's going to read it. Just be try to be as raw and as thoughtful and as courageous as possible. That's such a great message. And I, as a as someone finishing up a book, I uh, I appreciate hearing some of the things that I think uh, about the process confirmed. Um, so thank you very much, Scott. I want to tell people where they can find the book and where they can follow you for more of your insights. You mentioned no mal, uh, no mercy, no mal, no. What's the order? No mercy, no malice. Did no I have mercy, it right no first? malice. Yeah, that's All right. right. Uh, I, re I read it every week. I probably email you twice a year responding to it. I don't know if that gets tedious to you or if you if you I appreciate it. it, but you're just you're such a great writer. I can't help re replying sometimes. Um, you're on Twitter and LinkedIn. Those seem to be your two big social media platforms. I'm not on Twitter. I haven't posted in eight months. I'm on Threads. Out of Twitter. Good for you. I'm on LinkedIn and okay. um, the books and obviously the podcast Pivot and Prof G. Okay. Um, and so professorgalloway.com is the blog. You got it. All right. Very cool. Uh, congratulations on the algebra of wealth. I can't wait to uh, grab my copy and read it. We will link to it in the show notes below. Guys, thank you uh, very much. Scott, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Michael. Congratulations on your success. Thank you. Thank you.